Hello, my name is Martha Smith and I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension and today I'm going to be talking about seed starting. I'm going to be giving you a basic overall introduction. This is the first of a four-part series and we will walk you through the entire process starting seeds, germinating, seedling growth, transplanting, and uh, hardening off before you put them out. Starting a community garden, or you might have an existing community garden. Many of you might be interested in starting your own seeds so that you could have transplants to set out later. Well, hopefully with this four-part series, you'll be able to do that. But what is seed starting? Well, this is the official definition. Selecting viable seeds and providing them with all the complements of their natural environment, which are necessary for germination in a form or sequence which sets off the chain of events which leads to the production of seedlings. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of words in there. And, and really, what does it really mean? Well. I like to make it more simpler, easier. What we're doing is we are mimicking nature in order to get seeds to germinate and grow in an artificial environment. We are starting with those viable seeds and in an artificial environment, setting off that chain, that sequence of germination all the way through seedling growth. So I find this easier to understand because for many of us, we're not going to be starting our seeds outdoors. We're going to be starting them indoors. Perhaps you have a, a greenhouse um, or you're going to be dealing with just using grow lights. Either way, you're dealing with an artificial environment. So we're going to talk about why we start seeds. We're going to talk about the timing of when you should start them indoors. We'll talk about seed selection. Then we're going to discuss the, the growing process, starting with germination, seedling growth, and then hardening off before we set them outdoors. But first ask yourself, why, why start your own seeds? Well, there's many reasons. For a lot of people, they want to get a head start on the season. For some of your seeds, when you start them indoors, it will be recommended to start them maybe four to six weeks before you set them out. This will give you a more mature plant to set in the garden that will come to production earlier then if you direct seeded those directly into the garden after the last chance of frost. So you'll have a six week head start and you'll get harvest earlier. So a head start on the season should lead you to an earlier harvest. When you start seeds, you have a greater variety. You're not limited to what's available at the garden centers and the nurseries. You can grow what, you, what seeds you can find. You can experiment and try many different things. Cost savings, well, I put a question mark after that because yes, you can start seeds on a shoestring budget. It doesn't take a lot, but as with any hobby or something that we start up, there's a lot of bells and whistles. And depending on your budget, what you're able to afford, sometimes that cost savings isn't as uh, big as we realize. But then I like to do it because I enjoy it. I, I get a sense of satisfaction knowing that I started these seeds indoors and they're now growing in my garden. I like and enjoy the growing process. But before you start, you got to ask yourself some questions. Are you and your group able to devote time to this process? And if so, do you have enough space to do this correctly? And are you ready 
Do you have all your supplies? So, do you and your group have enough time? Well, annuals, which vegetables and our bedding plants fall under, are grouped into three general categories based on time needed. Some will need eight to 12 weeks of growing before being set out. Others will need six to eight weeks. And then we have those that require four to six weeks to start indoors before setting them out. So you can't start your seeds and say, well, I'm going to go head off to Florida for a couple weeks. You've got to be there or somebody has to be there to take care of them because you might be starting some seeds in mid-February and they're going to need your attention all the way through May. Do you have enough space for what you properly want to grow? Now, when we get into seed starting, there's various methods that you can do. You might be using a seed starting tray or maybe a plug tray. And here, a seed starting tray is just going to be a shallow, small container where you're going to put some media in and you're going to start all your seeds in there. So in this small container, let's say it's maybe a rectangle of four inches by eight inches, you could have a hundred seedlings. They can't stay in there. That's not going to be sustainable for them. They have to be bumped up to a larger container. So now that little space that you had for that seed tray becomes maybe four flats. And a flat is much larger. It's going to take up more space. So do you really have enough space for what you properly want to grow? And this is always a challenge for me because I grow under grow lights in my basement and I have very limited grow space. So it's valuable real estate and I only want to grow what I know I can't find elsewhere and I want to be able to properly grow it in the space that I have. And then are you ready? <clears throat> Is your growing area and all of your supplies clean? Sanitation is going to be your best defense against pests, diseases, and insects. You're growing in an env artificial environment. You, your best defense is making sure that you're not introducing any pathogens. So you want to clean down everything. You want to wash down your growing tables. If you're using old containers, clean them out. Wash them with soap and water and let them air dry. Use fresh growing media. Don't reuse what you used last year. Once you're done with this process, whatever you've used, I put it in my compost pile. I'm not going to reintroduce that next year because there's a good chance I'll be bringing in diseases and possibly insects. And I just clean up the room. I make sure everything's clean. I have everything ready because you could have pests and maybe some of you have done this. Maybe you've grown seedlings and you're growing them maybe upstairs in your living environment in a window and they're doing great. And then all of a sudden, one morning you come downstairs and they're all knocked over and there might be a little bit of fuzz growing on the, the media surface. Well, you've been hit with one of the many um, diseases that can occur early on in the, the seedlings life cycle. And that really just tells me that something wasn't clean. The container maybe had some residues left over from the year before or if you're using old media. So really, do, do your best to make sure that everything is clean. And then, do you have all your supplies? I like to order my seeds early. I like to order them before the first of the year. I hate when I get that little notice saying sold out. So I like to have them on hand. I make sure I have clean media. My containers are cleaned. I use artificial light, so I want to make sure my lights are ready. I have the most efficient light bulbs. Because again, once you start, 
you've got to keep this going until you're going to transplant them out. So when to begin? Let's talk a little bit about timing. So when is it safe to put most bedding vegetable plants outdoors where you live? Okay. Once you know that, then take that date and you start backwards, counting backwards. So you're going to start these seeds six to eight weeks ahead of time. Let's say you're going to target May 15th as your transplant date. Well, you're just going to get a calendar out and you're going to count backwards. And that's when you're going to start those seeds. Now, when is the recommended planting date for Illinois? Well, we have southern, central, and northern. I'm going to talk about northern Illinois. And in northern Illinois, the average date of our last frost is April 25th. Now, you're thinking, I can't plant at April 25th. Well, some cool season crops you might be able to, but for many of the things that we're going to be growing indoors, that's going to be too early. Now that is the average date of last frost. That means we have a 50-50 chance of getting a frost. So we give about a 10-day, two-week buffer and we recommend in Northern Illinois, May 10th or mid-month. For me, I, my target date is May 15th, and that's the date that I count backwards for all the different seeds I'm going to be starting. So I've got May 15th as my target date. I'm going to order my seeds early so I have them. I'm going to start to do some research. What's the information that I have on the back of the seed packet? Or maybe I'm going to go to the seed catalog and find out some more information about growing this type of seed. Or maybe I can go online and see what information I can find there. Count backwards from your planting date. Set your seed planting schedule because once you start, remember, you've got to pay attention. I usually set my schedule to start the first of the month or the 15th of the month, depending on the seed. So where can you go for your information? Well, this is a seed packet. And a seed packet will give you a lot of information. Here, this is Zinnia Thumbelina Mixed, a little annual flower I was growing. And in the, the top section, it tells you about how to direct seed. So in ordinary garden soil, sunny area, in spring, after danger of frost. So it's giving you all of that information. But if you drop down in garden hints, it says for earlier bloom, seeds may be started indoors five to seven weeks before outdoor planting time. Now, if this was the first year that I was growing this little Thumbelina mixed, I would probably start them six weeks ahead of uh, when I needed them. And I would keep it in a log book and make notes. So if I want to plant this again, I can say, okay, no, I really needed an extra week, or I think I could have started them at five weeks. So the seed packet has a lot of information. Also noticed on, on this seed packet that it was packed for 1996. This was the year that you can anticipate the greatest percentage of germination. This was the year it was packed for and you have seeds that are at their highest viability. And we're gonna talk about viability. It's the ability to germinate. If you save those seeds, Seeds, it, it, every seed is different, and some seeds will hold their viability for a long time, many years, and others will lose it very quickly. So you want to store them properly. In the coming years, if you used some of this old seed, 
you probably wouldn't get the 98% germination that you would that very first year. Now with some seeds, they're only going to tell you to direct seed. They're not going to say bother with starting them indoors. Radishes. Radishes, cool season. They don't have a lot of, you know, very long days to harvest. So in here, it's just telling you just plant um, how many seeds, how deep. They've got a little uh, map of the United States, so you have a little timing schedule there. And direct seeding, you're just working up your garden soil uh, and planting them according to the label instructions. Now, for some plants, as I said, I, I like to grow things that I readily can't find. And this was a plant that I started um, many years ago. This was in October um, of 03 when I took this picture. And this is a Cyanara cardunculus, sometimes called cardoon. Um, it's a member of the artichoke family. I grow it primarily for this big architectural foliage in my garden. So I needed to do some research because I had never grown this before. So the seed packet didn't have a lot of information, so I turned to the seed catalog and to the uh, seed company's website. So here, this was off of their website, and it's telling me uh, what I need to know to grow this particular bedding plant. So I'm looking at flower height, hardiness rating. I drop down to sowing instructions tells me that I want to sow them in trays or pots, what temperature, how deep. But notice it says sowing time, February to March. The seed can also be sown outdoors where it will flower in mid-spring. Okay, let's talk a little bit about hardiness. This plant for us in, in Illinois is going to be an annual. It's not going to be able to survive our winters. There, Illinois is divided into five different USDA hardiness zones. And these zones are based on the annual average cold temperature. Illinois is a long, narrow state. The very far northwest corner is zone 5A, which tells me that the average annual cold temperature is minus 20 to minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you go all the way to the southern tip of Illinois, and they're in zone 7, which their cold temperatures are 0 to 5 degrees above. In the Quad Cities, where I'm located, we're zone 5B, so our average annual cold temperature is minus 15 to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice the hardiness rating. I have it underlined up on, on top. This is hardy to zones 7, 8, and 9. 7, 8, and 9 is going to be your states south of Illinois all the way to the tip of the Florida Keys and the southern tip of Texas. In fact, when you get down to zone nine, their average annual cold temperature is uh, only 25 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit above zero. So reading this, there's no way I could sow these outdoors to have them flower in mid spring. So you need to do your research, especially if you're trying something a little more unusual. Find out and read and understand where is this hardy to and when should I start it. Now from experience, I have just learned through trial and error that I start this March 1st. The plant is a good size for, to be able to, for me to set it out in uh, the end of May. But also with our shorter growing season, our cooling temperatures, I don't expect it to flower and fruit. 
I just want the foliage. So let's start with the seed. Okay, when you're selecting, remember your space, your growing area. If you have restricted growing space, remember what you can adequately grow. Purchase new viable seed and choose the desired characteristics you want. How many do you think you need? And then I like to order maybe a little buffer zone of 20%. Up in the upper right corner, there's a little flower called gazania. And I was growing gazania because I liked the color and it was um, going to be able to tolerate the hot, dry spot I was putting it in. So I was choosing it for those desired characteristics. I knew I needed 24, they came packed 20 seeds per packet, I got two packets. Because not every single seed is going to germinate. You can anticipate maybe 95 to 98% germination from that first year. I like to order early because it ensures the availability and I can start my seeds on schedule. Now, what are some good seeders? Annuals. Annuals we generally think of as our flowering plants, our impatience, and our zinnias, and our marigolds. By definition, annual is a plant that's going to complete its life cycle in one growing season. They emerge in the spring, we plant them, and they set flower, set seed, and then with the cold temperatures they die. Really, our vegetables that we grow here in Illinois are for the majority annuals. We only expect them to, to live for that one season. So a lot of our flowering um, plants, our bedding plants are good seeders. Some of our herbs are good seeders. Like, uh, what comes to mind is dill. And then a lot of the vegetables that you're probably interested are good seeders. We often get good germination, fast growth, they're readily available. They, they, if you're going to collect seed, they often produce abundant seeds. Now notice I'm not talking about perennial plants, those plants that come back year after year. These are things that we have in our garden like hosta or daylilies. And I'm not talking about woody plant material, which would be your trees and shrubs. For these plants, seeding um, can be a bit more challenging because they often will have a dormancy restriction. And we're, we'll discuss that later. So we want to have viability. We want to have good viable seed. And that really just is the germination capability. There's a, on the seed packet, there's a date. If it doesn't, I write the year on the packet that I bought those seeds. Improperly stored seed or old seed can lose its viability. And this is based on the seed. They're all different. Some will hold their viability longer than others. So if you're going to store the seeds, you want to put them in a dark, cool, dry, pest-proof location. So if you're, if you're thinking, where are my seeds? Hmm, they're out in the shed, and boy, last winter it got down to zero, and hmm, it got over a hundred this past summer. Those aren't good seed storing temperatures. Store them dark, cool, dry, away from pests such as mice who can often get into to your seeds. So if you're going to collect seed rather than buy seed, there's a couple things that we have to talk about. We have to talk about genetics and you might see the terms hybrid or F1 hybrid on a seed packet. And I'm going to explain what those are. Now, when we propagate plants, there's two methods. One is sexual and the other is asexual. 
Sexual is where you take two parents, you cross them, pollination, the, the fruits are produced, and you get seeds. Okay, that's sexual reproduction. Asexual is where there's a characteristic of a plant that does not come true from seed. You grow the seeds and the characteristic, let's say you wanted a certain height or maybe a certain fruit size, doesn't come true. So we have to take a piece of that plant and grow it on. So we're taking some part of the plant. I'm showing you in the picture, we're taking cuttings and those cuttings will root. So we are taking the exact same genetic material off the plant and we're growing it on. This is also done with tissue culture, where they take cells and they grow them on to produce a plant. And this is called vegetative growth. So what we're talking about is an exchange of material between parents, pollination, and we're producing seed. When we talk about seeds, you might have heard the terms heirloom, and then you might have heard hybrid, or on a seed packet, you might see a little symbol that says F1. And, and what's the difference? Well, this is where we have to talk about genetics. An heirloom, those that you see pictured on the top, are those that have stood the test of time and maintain the desired characteristic that you want. These will grow true from seed. So they've stood the test of time. You collect seed every year. And when you grow them out the next year, you get the exact type of, of fruit, what you expected. Because whatever characteristics those are, they're dominant. And these are open pollinated. They're not doing any special cross pollination. They're just letting the wind and the bees and all the pollinators cross back and forth because the characteristic that you desire is going to be dominant. And that's where we get the expression, will grow true from seed. Heirlooms, I've heard the definition, you know, 50 years or more have been in the trade producing the same characteristics. Now hybrids, a hybrid is where man has intervened and they've taken two known parents with specific desired features and they cross pollinate them. It's under controlled pollination. They're not letting wind or any of the po other pollinators come around so that they know that the seed that's resulting will have the desired characteristics. Now I'm showing you there a little tomato. It's called Red Racer and notice it says F1. The easiest way to explain F1 is first generation after pollination. So Red Racer is a cocktail sized tomato, produces small uniform fruit with great taste. Um, it has a compact size. Um, it's got an early yield, all these good things. So you grow it and you say, wow, I really like this. So I'm gonna save the seeds for next year. Well, the seeds that you're collecting are not first generation anymore. They're actually gonna be second generation and they've been op open pollinated. So you're getting everything crossing with everybody else. Most often the trait that a hybrid has that we want is recessive. And now through this open pollination, dominant traits can start to show through. So often with your hybrids, you'll hear the term they don't come true from seed. So you collect these seeds and you grow them on. And next year, boy, maybe you have some plants that are popping up to six feet. Maybe some of them are giving you big, like four inch di diameter fruit. Nothing compared to what you had the year before. 
So if there are certain plants that you want certain specific characteristics, and it says hybrid or F1, you really need to consider buying fresh seed every year. And people will comment, well, those seeds are, are so expensive. Why are they so much more expensive? Well, across the controlled pollination, uh, you, there's, there's money, there's, there's cost recovery, so the seeds are going to cost more. Okay. Now, one last thing that I want to talk about when um, we talk about seed starting is dormancy. And dormancy is a condition that prevents the seeds from germinating even when given proper conditions. And when you think about it, this really is kind of a survival mecha mechanism for seeds. Because seeds right now, we're, uh, today is the uh, last Friday in uh, September, so a lot of our plants are shutting down, a lot of our produce in our gardens, we're getting to the final harvests, and if any fruit drop and start to break down, those seeds, if they germinated right now, would not make it through the winter. So many of them have some type of dormancy that will actually prevent them from germinating until the following spring when the growing conditions are, are advantageous. Now with dormancy, there are external factors and there's internal factors. External factors, um, physical is where you have a very hard seed coat um, and the seed just can't take up uh, moisture to start the germination process. Um, and that's, that's physical, so maybe we have to nick or scratch or crack the seed coat. Uh, mechanical, even though the seed can absorb moisture, uh, it just, the, the seed coat is too hard. It's too hard. And there, again, you might have to crack it or nick it or scratch it. Chemical is where chemicals accumulate um, and prevent germination and really just need to be leached out. So you think about that seed dropping in the fall, through the winter months, snowfall, rain, all of that is leaching out that chemical so that they can germinate in the spring. Um, so th there's, there's all of these, and there's many that could be a combination of these three. Internal, we have physiological and morphological. Physiological, the seeds have specific environmental uh, germination requirements. Maybe they need light. Some seeds need light to germinate, or they have to have dark, or they have to have cool temperatures, or they're not going to germinate until a certain daytime temperature is reached. Morphological is when the embryo isn't fully developed and it needs time to mature. And again, you might have combinations of all of the above. So do your research. Um, the two most common dormancy treatments that you'll probably uh, be faced with is stratification and scar scarification. Stratification often is a cold treatment given to the seed to hasten germination. And you should find this on the seed packet, or you might find it in the seed catalog or maybe at the website. And here it might say place in refrigerator for four weeks before uh, starting indoors. It might say place seed with some moist media in a Ziploc bag, place it in the refrigerator for four weeks. And when you think about this, remember when we started this topic, I said you're going to mimic nature to get those seeds to germinate. Well, with stratification, what you're doing is you're artificially giving them winter. So you're just speeding up the process. The other is scarification, and this is where that seed coat is impermeable to water or gases. You might have to scratch it or crack the seed coat. 
Um, some will tell you to soak in a mild acid solution to soften the seed coat. Others might say to put overnight in a hot or warm water soak, again, to soften the seed coat. Scratching or cracking, this could be um, in replacement of maybe animals grazing and chewing on the seeds and cracking them open, or maybe animals walking over them and cracking their seed coats. And an acid coat, what would that mimic? Well, passing through the intestines of an animal and being uh, treated with the stomach acids softens the seeds and then they come out the other end and they're ready to go. So if you've had trouble with some seeds in the past, do the research and find out maybe there's a dormancy situation. So we've talked about just the basics of seed starting. In our next session, we're going to talk about germinating and things that you need to consider. You need to have water. Seeds need oxygen. You have to think about light. Some need light and some need darkness. You have to think about temperature. Uh, bottom heat will be discussed. And then what are you growing? Some have specific preferences. Some are cool temperature crops, broccoli, lettuce, pansies, onions. All of those really do best 40 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But then there are those that have to have warm temperatures. We can't set those out until we know the soil temperatures and the air temperatures are warm, 65 to 85 degrees. Beans, peppers, melons, tomatoes. And understand you want to have viable seed that is that are going to have the highest percentage for germination for that seed and the seed must not be dormant. So you're going to have to do some research. So that ends introduction. The next session, which Alicia will be uh, teaching you, will be actually starting the seeds and walking you through germination. Then I'll be back and I'll talk about seedling growth and then Alicia is going to finish off with transplanting, seedling growth, and hardening off. This is our horticulture website. It, we have lots of information up there. If there's other things that you'd like to learn about, I strongly recommend that you visit uh, and you'll find stuff on composting, trees, shrubs, herbs, planting bulbs, all sorts of information. So here's my contact information, that's my email, and if you have any questions at a further date, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you.